Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Ontario Justice Education Network, I want to welcome you guys to today's webinar, which is titled Ideology and Violence, Why Charging Incels with Terrorism May Make Matters Worse. Um, we really just want to take a minute up top to say thank you to everyone who's made time to join us for this today. We know that I, I won't bore you with the with the trite condolences about what a strange time this is, but you know, we, we have a lot of teachers on staff. We have a lot of people on staff with kids who are in schools. And genuinely, um, we are floored by how much commitment all of uh, our teacher partners are showing to, you know, keeping things moving and uh, to show up as well for sort of extracurricular professional development type things like this is, is really remarkable. So we're so, so happy to have you here. Um, I'm Michelle Thompson. Uh, I'm OGEN's Manager of Legal and Digital Development, and I'm going to be moderating today on behalf of the organization. Uh, and I'm very excited to introduce our two guests. Uh, so Reem Body is an Associate Professor at the University of Windsor's Faculty of Law, where since 2002, she's researched and taught about various aspects of as access to justice. Her most recent research project examines how Canadian human rights tribunals have responded to anti-Arab animus and Islamophobia. And Fahad Ahmed is a PhD candidate at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. His doctoral research focuses on the impact of national security policies on Muslim civil society organizations in Canada and the UK. So before we get started, um, I want to acknowledge that Fahad and I are calling in from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We both live on land that's covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, in which today is home to a huge range of First Nations people, Métis people, and Inuit. Um, this has been my home for, for most of my life, including um, the last... 14 years, uh, and so I, I owe my respects to this space. Um, I'd also like to note that uh, Fahad's academic institution, Carleton, sits on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, and so our work is also in dialogue with that history as well. And Reem comes to us today from the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, you know, there, there are always some challenges that, that we found in, in figuring out how to do appropriate territorial acknowledgements for online events where people are calling in from all over the place. And I know from looking at who's registered for our webinar today that uh, you and the audience are across Ontario as well. Um, so if you haven't done so before, we really encourage you to take a minute to look at uh, whose traditional territory you are living and working on today. Um, it's a really important part of the work of reconciliation, and it's something that uh, we're taking really seriously as an organization. So a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we are in webinar mode today. So if you're in the audience, your camera and mic are off by default. You don't have to worry about getting caught on camera. If there are dogs or kids in the background, no problem. Uh, chat is open, and we encourage you to use the Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions you'd like to put to Reem or Fahad. Uh, those questions come straight to me. Uh, so you can also use the Q&A to send me a message if you have any technical issues or, or anything that you wanna check in about. Um, we are recording, so we'll make a copy of this video available to you guys after the fact, as well as uh, the PowerPoint if we get permission to share that. Um, so with no further preamble from me, uh, I'm gonna share the PowerPoint and turn it over to you guys. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and we can go to slide three if that's all right. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting us and allowing us to speak with you. We are uh, grateful to have received the invitation after uh, an article that we wrote on the conversation. And uh, today we're happy to share some of the arguments that we make in that article. Um, before we jump in though, we'd uh, just like to acknowledge upfront that uh, gender-based violence in Canada is a very serious issue and uh, are, as, as you hear us make our argument, it in no way undermines the seriousness of gender-based violence. On the contrary, uh, 
uh, we think it is a, a fundamental social issue and should be addressed uh, as such. Uh, our analysis uh, focuses on the national security response that has been used to marshal uh, counterterrorism laws and frameworks to address the problem of incels. Uh, and uh, what we argue is that it has the potential to be counterproductive. Uh, so next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so who are incels? Well, incel stands, uh, it's an abbreviation or kind of a mush together uh, terminology for involuntary celibates. It's a shorthand uh, for people who say they're unable to have sex despite wanting to and trying. Uh, it originated uh, as an online website in the late 90s by a woman, believe it or not, who was a graduate of Carleton University uh, to express frustrations about sexuality and dating. Since then, it has uh, taken on a life of its own and it has grown into an online subculture through sites such as 4chan and Reddit. And uh, these online spaces are dominated by uh, cis men who believe uh, in sort of a hierarchical society based on physical characteristics. Uh, they hold essentialist and misogynistic views about women whom they blame for their situation uh, or their, their position in the hierarchy, which they believe is uh, lower in the hierarchy. Uh, and a fraction of them have adopted militant views and, and even a fewer number of them have resorted to uh, violence. Uh, so this community of incels online is predominantly men. Uh, they've not had meaningful relationships with women. Uh, they're mostly in North America and Europe. They're mostly white. Uh, and several of them suffer from mental health issues. Some uh, analysts have linked uh, incel online activity to racist far right activity as well. So there is overlap in those communities. And uh, in a 2019 report uh, released by uh, uh, Canada's intelligence agency, CSIS, uh, they've chosen to classify incel as something they call ideologically motivated violent extremism. Uh, why have they done so well? It's, it's sort of that's because we've faced incidents of incel motivated violence in the last three years. Uh, in 2018, uh, I'm sure, uh, all of you are aware, uh, a guy by the name of Alec Manassian drove a truck into pedestrians in uh, Toronto and he ended up killing 10 people. Uh, in 2019, uh, another man attempted to uh, stab and murder a woman and her child in Sudbury, Ontario. And then uh, last year in 2020, early 2020, a 17 year old youth uh, murdered a woman in a massage parlor and injured another woman. So uh, what happened, uh, next slide please. So what happened as a result of that, uh, uh, that incident in 2020, the stabbing in 2020, is that for the very first time, RCMP upgraded the murder charge against the 17 year old to uh, include a terrorism charge. Uh, what that means is that it's, uh, uh, when, when the RCMP uh, or the police arrest somebody, they charge them against the criminal code for a criminal offense. Uh, and there is a section of the code that deals specifically with uh, terrorism. It's, it's called section 83 or the most of section 83 deals with that anyways. And it was expanded as part of uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act in the aftermath of 9-11. So in uh, 2001, late 2001, uh, Canada amended the criminal code and added section or expanded rather section 83 to include terrorism charges, which didn't exist before that uh, point in time. What's unique about charging someone with terrorism is that the code says that uh, the offense has to be uh, politically, religiously, or ideologically motivated. So in other words, uh, it falls upon uh, the prosecution to demonstrate that there was an ideological motive behind a crime and, and, and actually there was an, uh, th uh, that ideological, political, religious motive behind a crime and that was a departure from the criminal code in 2001. So uh, why is this arrest important or why is this an inflection point, let's say, in, uh, in terrorism charges since 2001? Well, for the, for, uh, first it's because it's the first time that 
any country, uh, any Western country has charged an individual uh, for incel related terrorism. Uh, the technical challenge obviously for based on, because of this charge is going to be to prove that it's in fact, it was incel motivated. Uh, and uh, the other issue with having uh, the police or having uh, the RCMP uh, make an assessment of an ideological motivation is that a lot of national security scholars think that the correlation between ideology and violence is still poorly understood, that people can be very ideologically motivated and yet not resort to violence. So for so when this amendment was introduced in the criminal code in 2001, it raised a number of questions about whether it even makes sense to be charging somebody based on ideological motivation. And what does that even mean to be, if somebody is ideologically motivated, how do you assess that? So those sorts of challenges around any terrorism charge, let alone an incel terrorism charge have been, have been a part of the national security discourse since 2001. Uh, the second problem, uh, the, or not problem, but the second thing that makes this charge unique is that there have been 58 terrorism charges in Canada since 2001. 56 of those 58 charges have been related to uh, what is called, quote, Islamist violence. And what that means is that they have been deemed to be, the individuals who have been charged have been deemed to have been motivated by a, by a, Islamist group or a group that claims to be motivated by a kind of uh, uh, Islam that uh, resorts to violence, uh, it, to put it very crudely. I mean, the, there are a certain set of groups that are called Islamist groups that, you know, most Muslims will tell you that it has nothing to do with Islam, but uh, the way that these groups are named and the way in which they are classified is that there is a correlation made between uh, religion uh, which is part of this uh, part of this code, and between violence, and so that again becomes a kind of a linkage, which is problematic for obvious reasons that you know it criminalizes entire Muslim communities. Uh, the so fifty six were Islamist related terrorism charges. One had to do with an individual who was financing a Tamil group that was considered a terrorist group or an extremist group. And the 58 is obviously this particular charge. So it's pretty uh, sort of, you know, unprecedented, uh, this insult related terrorism charge. Uh, the usually also the way terrorism charges have worked in Canada is that uh, they're justified by connecting the perpetrator or the offender to a group on a terrorism watch list that the government maintains. Uh, and in this case, obviously this individual is not affiliated with any group on that watch list. Also, it should be noted that uh, when Alexandre Bissonnette shot uh, and killed uh, people in the Quebec City mosque shooting, or more recently last year when uh, 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 an individual by the name of Corey Huron, uh, he was a man who rammed a truck with firearms into the gates of Rideau Hall in Ottawa. Uh, they were both, for example, not charged with terrorism. Uh, and so what this says to us also is that uh, uh, law enforcement themselves, or certainly the RCMP, uh, which takes the lead on terrorism cases, uh, is being selective about whom they charge with terrorism. Uh, in fact, uh, they take a I know it when I see it approach. Uh, and as I said earlier, what that has disproportionately done is it has criminalized Muslim communities or seen Muslim violence as terrorism and other forms of violence as not. Uh, and from a from an academic uh, viewpoint, uh, a sociologist by the name of Lisa Stamnitsky uh, has written this ex as, this excellent book, which reminds us that terrorism is actually a social construction uh, that is made by terrorism experts and by policing agencies. And when somebody is charged with terrorism, it's not so much a technical issue, but much more a commentary on the legitimacy and the morality of the violence that they're charged for. So I'll stop here and I'll hand it to Reem. Thank you, Fahad. Um, so as Fahad noted, after a murder in um, 2020, uh, and the name of the woman who was murdered is Ashley Arzaga, uh, the RCMP provided two arguments to support the expanded charge to include terrorism. First, they said that the expanded charge would advance equality 
And by equality, they meant um, two on two scales for uh, religious and racial equality. And so charging uh, a individual who is associated with a group that is not connected to the Muslim community was supposed to signal a shift away from um, disproportionate targeting of the Muslim community. And then taking a stand uh, or appearing to take a stand on violence against, the, uh, against women through this means was supposed to signal that misogyny and violence against women would be taken seriously. Um, the RCMP on the date that it decided to expand the charge released a statement that included this line. Terrorism comes in many forms, and it's important to note that it's not only restricted to particular groups, religions, or ideologies. So in other words, they were signaling that part of the reason why they made this charge was because they would um, lessen the Islamophobic impact or perception of anti-terrorism legislation. And a number of academics and commentators agreed. Kent Roach, for example, who is a, a national security expert at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto, had this to say, uh, quote, one of my concerns is coming out of 9-11 is that there's been a sense that it's only terrorism if it looks like 9-11. So that was on the Islamophobia side. But the argument was that this expanded charge would also bring forward uh, equality for women because it would indicate that the state would take all of the tools at its disposal to protect women from violence. And so one of the commentators, for example, put it this way, it's important symbolically for the state to indicate that it will apply terrorism laws wherever they feel that they can prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond the equality argument, the argument was also made that by allowing terrorism charges to be brought forward in these kinds of cases against incel, the police and national security agencies would then have a broader range of tools at their disposal that would deter or prevent violence like this happening in the future. Um, and these tools would allow them to um, not only bring charges, which would have a deterrence effect, but they could also use things like enhanced surveillance. And ultimately, the argument went, uh, keep us all safer, but in particular, by focusing on incels, reduce violence against women. So next slide, please. So we respond to this argument, as Fahad has said, or these arguments, not by suggesting that the goals of equality and pre uh, prevention of violence against women in particular are not important goals. Far from it, what our arguments break down into three categories. And we say first that the, the idea of expanding terrorism as a tool against, uh, to be used against incels to prohibit or uh, deter violence against women does not advance the goals of equality and security. We also worry that those who pick up uh, these arguments are not fully considering some very worrying trends in counterterrorism. And then finally, we say that there's a concern about diverting both resources and attention away from more productive responses to violence against women. So I'll uh, quickly go through some of these arguments and Fahad uh, will take some and I will take some. And then we're hoping that we have time for some conversation or questions. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. So the first um, argument that we make against this expanded application of anti-terrorism laws and strategies is rooted in response to the idea that uh, expanding the definition actually makes things better for Muslim communities because they will no longer be the um, 
disproportionate target of anti-terrorism. Uh, anti and here what we point out is that treating two groups badly is not the answer to discrimination. And this is sometimes uh, in law referred to as equal graveyards, creating equal graveyards for two different groups. And what we argue is that charging incels only covers up the problem of Islamophobia, and it diverts our attention away from some of the questions that we need to really ask if we are interested in reducing Islamophobia in society. And these are questions like, why is there Islamophobia? How, do, um, how does civil society respond to the problems of Islamophobia? Where does Islamophobia is, exist? To what extent is it actually manifest in the institutions that we are empowering to, uh, to fight uh, Islamophobia? So our point here is that basically this kind of an equality argument that's directed at uh, the conclusion that uh, expanding the definition of anti-terrorism reduces Islamophobia is really just an illusion. It only just creates an illusion of equality. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. The other argument we make, or another argument we make, is that in fact, uh, directing our attention to what we know about incels and what the experts are saying about what we need to do in response to their violence, both at an individual and a group level, um, we would not come to the conclusion that anti-terrorism laws and adding uh, terrorism charges to the murder charge that was already directed against the individual who killed Ashley Azara is the way to go. So when we look at some of the available literature, the points that are made is that these individuals need help and they need social connections and that confrontational responses, in, and we categorize anti-terrorism labeling or as a confrontational response, only um, fortifies the group's belief system or the, the belief that they are actually victims of society and social relations. And one of the experts in this area has said that building awareness of the availability of social services in a way that's anonymous, accessible, and as free from stigma as possible is an important first step. So of course, labeling incels as terrorists stigmatizes them and isolates them further, which is exactly the opposite of what um, the experts tell us we need to do. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it back to Fahad. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so the other uh, concern that we have with, uh, with allowing R the RCMP and CSIS, uh, which are the kind of the two main institutions that uh, lead terrorism investigation on the enforcement side of things uh, and investigation side of things, is that uh, the well just to back up a little bit so the rcmp is the federal police it uh, has a federal mandate uh, and uh, many small communities across canada contract out policing to the rcmp but the rcmp also has the responsibility uh, for national security and so pretty much any national security investigation the rcmp is involved the other agency CSIS, which is canada's intelligence agency uh, its job, uh, well, at least until recently, was intelligence gathering. Uh, they were supposed to only collect and anal analyze data. And if uh, a case became serious enough, they are supposed to hand it over to the RCMP, which does the enforcement. Uh, 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 so there's been a recent change in that ability. There have been some bills passed in the last five years that have given RCMP a little bit, uh, sorry, given CSIS a little bit more responsibility than just doing investigations. Uh, and that has raised some concerns about uh, accountability and oversight, which you'll talk about in a second. But uh, coming back to the role of CSIS and RCMP in carrying out national security investigations, it's been pretty bad. Essentially, what they've done is uh, they have done what we, they've cast a wide net in terms of policing. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, 
uh, Reem just mentioned Kent Roach's article, basically the view has been that if it looks like something done by uh, Muslim perpetrators and looks like something that was like done uh, kind of like 9-11, that, that is th these, these perpetrators has had some connection with an Islamist group, then we, you know, basically this is a terrorism charge. They, they ended up as a result of that criminalizing entire Canadian Muslim communities. So uh, Canadian Muslim communities have been under surveillance since 2001. Uh, they get unsolicited visitations by the RCMP and CSIS at their homes and workplaces until today. Uh, more, perhaps more egregiously, uh, the RCMP has violated fundamental charter rights by resorting to detention and torture, or, or certainly outsourcing that in the case of uh, the prominent case of Meher Arar, for example. Uh, they've also relied on questionable techniques like entrapment and uh, sort of, you know, relying on uh, secret spies and things of that sort. Uh, also, these are the same institutions that are, that have once upon time uh, carried out surveillance of individuals and groups, including feminists, uh, including, and they still continue the surveillance and monitoring of indigenous protesters, anti-pipeline protesters. Uh, once upon a time, uh, entire LGBTQ communities were under surveillance and investigation by the RCMP. Uh, Anti-capitalist activists are still looked upon uh, as a threat to the peace and order of Canada. And so these, these things make us ask some questions about the seriousness of these institutions to really tackling uh, gender-based violence. And of course, we know that within these institutions, the culture is rife with misogyny and bullying and racism. Uh, we know very little about CSIS. All we know is based on cases that CSIS employees have filed against CSIS. And as a result of what we learn uh, from the court hearings is what we know about CSIS. Uh, but with the RCMP, I, I mean, you know, they've been, uh, if, I encourage you to just Google RCMP problems and there's a Wikipedia entry with essentially like, you know, you could spend a week going over it. Uh, and several of those issues have to do with sexual harassment within the RCMP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the other issue with these institutions is the accountability. So, uh, you know, typically uh, CSIS has operated uh, with uh, almost no oversight. This technically there is an oversight agency, but it's very weak. It has no ability to enforce anything. It can only make recommendation or advise things to the government. There've been some changes in, the regard, in that regard uh, in terms of establishing a, a larger oversight agency that it will now, uh, oversee what happens at uh, the RCMP CSIS. Uh, there's a portion of CSIS that does sort of the, the technology and intelligence gathering, CSE, that agency, and uh, CBSA, which is our border agency. Uh, so despite those developments, I think just in terms of the resourcing of the oversight agency and the uh, mandate given to that uh, oversight agency, it's unclear that this will necessarily allow us to see changes in the way that these institutions work. Uh, also, I mean, you know, if you all have been reading the news, you know that the RCMP is a pretty rigid organization. It's reluctant to change. You all may have heard Commissioner Lucky uh, essentially deny that there's systemic racism in the RCMP. And part of it has to also do with the fact that uh, the RCMP is essentially uh, paramilitary or, or its origins is that of a paramilitary uh, organization that was created to repress indigenous uprisings uh, when the Canadian settler colonial state was being established. So uh, there is some sort of continuity in the way the RCMP is set up from that history that we simply cannot disconnect. Uh, and so, so, you know, this also, uh, without proper civilian oversight of these agencies, we should be asking questions about how effective these agencies could be in tackling gender-based gender, gender -based violence. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, I think the, the, the sort of the main question is, so what does it actually mean to basically cast young men as incels or national security threats, right? Uh, or young men who are who are deemed to be incels as national security th threats. Uh, so in the past, what we know from 2001, the way that the RCMP and CSIS have conducted investigations is that uh, they uh, essentially make connections between individuals with 
with groups that are on this terrorism watch list. Uh, and so it's been easy in the past because <laughs> they've been able to identify Muslims and Arabs based on race, ethnicity, based on national connection that was transnational. It's obviously once you start saying that, well, incels who are essentially white men who are uh, also uh, national security threats, it's unclear what, what series of steps uh, that might propel. What we think will happen is that, or could happen rather, it's not clear that it will happen, but what, what we think could happen is that there's a whole preventative counterterrorism apparatus set up that allows uh, the RCMP to, for example, freeze people's assets or use a type of restraining order called the terrorism peace bond, where if they can't demonstrate uh, or reach the criminal threshold of charging somebody, they can meet a much lower threshold and go to a judge and obtain a restraining order to restrict somebody from moving about or accessing the internet, things of that sort. Uh, we also think that the CSIS could potentially use its disruptive powers, which means that it can do things that violate charter rights or it can use uh, entrapment, it can use uh, illegal, torture, illegal torture legitimately. So these are all things that have been allowed as part of the recent changes to the Anti-Terrorism Act. Potentially, this could happen. Potentially, it could increase increase online surveillance because we know that incels are primarily an online uh, community. So uh, it could intensify surveillance and online activity. And finally, there's a whole uh, sort of uh, uh, tool of activities called countering violent extremism, which essentially has seen national security agencies try and use uh, or rather uh, animate uh, security actions in the social and cultural sphere of society. So working with civil society organizations or nonprofit organizations and having them, training them, for example, to identify violent extremists uh, and, and, and essentially point them out uh, for the RCMP and CSIS. Uh, so expanding surveillance agents, if you will. But uh, the concerns with uh, countering violent extremism type programs is that uh, they end up pathologizing individual behavior. So, you know, you're looking for that particular person who will become a radical, quote unquote, a radical or a violent extremist. Uh, but but it, it does nothing to look at the structural issues that might lead to those sorts of uh, those sorts of behaviors in the first place. I'm going to hand back to you, Rain. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we end on this observation that violence against women is a societal problem and it requires a societal response. Um, we've put up a quote here from a reporter of La Presse and she was reflecting on 30 years after the Polytechnique massacre. Some of you may remember that after Marc Le Pen went in and um, murdered women in uh, the Polytechnique Institute because he deemed them to be feminists, that on him was also found a list of other women that he wanted to um, find and murder. And Francine, Francine Pelletier, sorry, um, was on that list. She made the observation that for many years after the killing, there was resistance amongst some in Quebec to see what happened as more than an isolated act of a troubled man and to come to terms with what was so clear that women and feminists were targeted. And I think this reinforces the point that Fahad just made that if we take an anti-terrorism response to incels, what we're doing is we're actually um, maybe ironically or unintentionally, but our experience shows us that we end up pathologizing individuals and making the problem an individual problem while directing our attention away from the fact that incels are a symptom and they're a symptom of, the, of uh, the ways in which violence against women are embedded in our larger society. And so if we have a societal problem, we need a societal response. So we argue that rather than pouring money and resources, credibility, expertise into national security agencies and national security strategies, 
What we need to do is pour the resources, give the credibility, and acknowledge the expertise of civil society that is uh, directed towards reducing violence against women. And so that means a multiplicity of strategies. And I'm sure actually all of you have um, better understanding of what the range of possibilities are, but let me just throw out a few. Uh, public education about discrimination and violence, including of course, gender-based violence a review and reform of laws that perpetuate uh, or deny or diminish gender-based violence, whether that's in the criminal justice system or in the ways in which we respond or don't respond to individual women who are facing violence. Whether it's a more broad uh, assessment and examination of the ways in which poverty and violence against women uh, intersect and the way in which poverty itself is a system that reinforces violence against women. Whether it's more counseling services um, for youth, but those also directed at incels and those who identify within cells, as we've suggested earlier, because the response that um, the experts have told us is needed is to bring them back into society, not to isolate them further, or whether it's more funding for schools and teachers and the sites in which uh, young people and, and others come together and the places in which connections can be made so our main message, I think at the end of the day, is that equality, including equality for women and prevention, including prevention of violence against women, means prioritizing a non-security response. And by a non-security response, we mean a response that prioritizes funding and empowering a broad spectrum of civil society and experts outside of what we think is a deeply problematic uh, set of national security agencies and responses. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening and we look forward to your questions. All right, so I, I invite anyone who has questions or comments for our guests to drop them in the Q&A. I have a quick one for you just to give people a minute to, to get typing. Um, what, what sort of response did you get to this article in general? Did you hear from other academics or other experts or from the public? Um, Fahad, I, I don't know what response you got. I didn't actually get anything directly. I had a few students who wrote to me and who said, but what about the problem of violence against women? And so it was actually that response, that, that question that um, made us realize that when we speak about this topic, we need to put up front that we are not in any way dismissing that problem, that our main point is that these are strategies that are ultimately not going to help uh, in alleviating violence against women. Um, I think that there that uh, there were some folks who were associated with CSIS who didn't like our article, uh, but not necessarily because of the particular arguments that we were making, uh, but specifically about the arguments that might have been related to institutional trustworthiness and the lack of the accountability structures and pointing out how history suggests to us that this is, these are not institutions, symbolically or otherwise, who we would want to entrust with this very important task. Maha, do you have any, did you get anything that I'm not aware of? Uh, no, the, the only thing I think you know this, Reem, but we got maybe a comment uh, for our article. So the conversation allows you to make comments. Uh, and, and I guess one the question like one of the things we took issue with was the expansion of uh, national security agencies 
operating before charging somebody with a charge or essentially before the investigation reaches the threshold where it starts, uh, they start building a case for a criminal charge, so like way before that, um, which is called preemption in sort of the, the academic terminology around uh, terrorism cases. And there's a lot of interest in preemptively acting, so acting today so that you might prevent a future uh, event of terrorism. Uh, and the problem that we lay out with that is uh, the future is essentially an unknown. And what you're trying to do is trying to develop techniques of security governance to manage something that's an unknown. I think what we don't understand from an academic standpoint is the correlation between extreme ideology and violence. I think there still remains a gap because they, there are a vast number of people who might hold very extreme views, uh, you know, and I, I, I kind of tell people that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, you could have people who are extremely religious or you could have people who are extremely racist and you could have people, you know, who have these extreme views, you know, who are extremely anti-capitalist, but that doesn't mean that they're going to commit an act of violence. And I think until we understand that for us to be governing a future occurrence of an act of violence is essentially making up uh, the solutions to a problem that we don't even know how it fully manifests. Uh, and so we had an exchange around that to one comment as to the person who was asking, well, what's wrong with acting preemptively? Um, so, yeah, I think that I do think it genuinely to, you know, to kind of be as, as fair to those people as, as possible. I, I do emotionally understand why it's frustrating when we hear cases like, um, that, which this is repeated over and over again in the media that this person finally did their big act of domestic violence or um, you know things that without attaching the big capital T terrorism label to certainly has an ideological component it is very violent and hearing oh they you know three different people had tried to talk to police about their behavior and there were all these things that in hindsight can look really easily like warning signs so I think I think one of the hardest things, you know, even even for people who, you know, really are on board with the, the long term thrust of your argument and the big picture of this problem to, to get a handle on is what do we do then concretely and today with the fact that we know that there are groups that are organizing online with an explicitly hateful and, you know, uh, uh, a um, what, what really seems like and sometimes does manifest as a desire to do harm to specific identifiable groups. Um, I think that's a really hard thing to, to sort of um, process and, and draw lines for yourself about, uh, you know, the expansion of, of CSIS surveillance to online versus a certain predictability of something happening at some point. Can I, um, can I jump in on that, Michelle? Please, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I think um, we would not want to give up tools that work. Sure. Um, and if, I think if we thought that these were tools that work, um, we would um, be very careful about saying we need to not use these tools. Um, in the regrettable, really tragic cases where um, the violence has already taken place, murder charges are already available and, right. and were made. Um, my, I mean, I can imagine a scenario and uh, just responding to the part about online hate um, where let's, let's assume a young man is in has found himself in an incel community and he's not sure you know he's he's not sure um once the once the label terrorism is put on that group or on that way of thinking what are the odds of that young man coming forward and saying you know i i need help i need some counseling i need I would, it would stand to reason, it seems to me, that the odds would be lessened if we're taking an approach that stigmatizes. And that's exactly what the experts are telling us. 
And so what we're doing there is not solving the problem, but in fact, pushing that young man more into the arms of the extremists. Now, that, that doesn't even, a, I mean, that just takes seriously that the more extreme equals the more violent. And as Fahad has already pointed out, that's actually not the case right. from, from what we know. I mean, even if we go back and take a look at um, Alexander Bissonnette, I mean, he said some pretty horrible things. This is the guy who um, was responsible for the mosque massacre. He said some horrible things online. There's no question of that. But was he the most extreme online? No, no, he was not. And I think that just shows uh, or helps to illustrate uh, as a case study Fahad's point that extremism and violent action don't necessarily go together. So, um, sure. You know, it's not <laughs> what you're looking, what, what you would look for if that's not the case. Right. And, and I do take your point for sure that um, where we want very fine distinctions to be made, there's not a whole lot of reason to think that the RCMP or CSIS necessarily will be, you know, the ones to exercise all, all due uh, subtlety and consideration there. Um, so uh, we've had a question come in that I want to put to you, uh, which is that, um, do your arguments mean that you think there are very few or no circumstances where a terrorism charge is appropriate um, or necessary. I'm curious also about uh, what you think um, the terrorism charge is meant to accomplish that a, a murder charge or another alternate kind of charge doesn't do. So is that is that question uh, specifically in relation to incel or terrorism charges more broadly, like the concept of terrorism? I think this question is uh, like, would you take the position that there are essentially no circumstances in general writ large where terrorism makes sense as a charge? Um, Fahad, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you jump in. I have something to say, but I took the last one. So I'll let you jump in and then I'll add my two cents. Uh, yeah, sure, certainly. Uh, so uh, I, I think what we are, well, this article was the uh, the argument is around sort of the appropriateness of a terrorism charge relating to an incel related case, right? So uh, specifically, we were talking um, in that context, and uh, we were drawing upon what we've observed since 2001, since terrorism charges were made available in the criminal code. So just a few things to uh, to to sort of you know uh, keep in mind or a few considerations I think that would I mean it's almost impossible for us as people who don't have information uh, behind each case to be able to uh, you know definitively say whether this case was appropriate or this case was not appropriate there's a lot of secrecy shrouded around national security investigations so number one I think what a lot of civil society organizations especially I can tell you my research is on Muslim civil society organizations. So what they've been demanding is more transparency. So when, for example, we are told in the public terrorism threat report that is put out by Public Safety Canada almost on an annual basis that, hey, the most pressing terrorism threat we have is X, uh, we're told, well, what are the numbers? Uh, you know, how is, does this threat compare, for example, uh, so the long standing argument uh, that the Muslim community has been making is how does this threat stand in comparison, for example, to far right extremism, because there is a lot of research done on far right extremism that suggests that there are in back in 2015, Bart Perry, who is a, a criminologist in uh, Oshawa, uh, wrote about how there are at least 100 armed right wing groups in Canada. Uh, but they have not been thought of as a national security threat until very recently. Um, and so those types of questions need a bit more transparency. The second thing I'll say is that, in fact, yes, terrorism is a discourse that it is not so much, you know, it's not to say that terrorism doesn't happen or terrorism charges shouldn't be laid, but it's more to say that uh, 
who tells us what is a terrorism charge matters. And what we were like the two examples that I get, for example, Alexandra Bissonnette was not a terrorist because you know we were given a bunch of technical reasons as to why we couldn't lay a terrorism charge on him or uh, the gentleman who rammed Radio Hall with a, with, a, with a truck full of explosives was not a terrorist. So whereas it's very easy to say that Meher Arar was a terrorist or a member of Al-Qaeda because of which he could be sent over to Syria for uh, detention and torture. And, and you know, that, that is okay. That mistake is okay. So the, the question for us then starts, uh, and what we've observed is that there's a lot of, well, uh, people say implicit bias, but I'd go so far as to say that a structural bias in the way that the systems, the counterterrorism systems have been set up and they've been structurally biased to see certain people, certain groups of people as terrorists. Uh, and that I think is something we should, uh, we should take issue with. Uh, so I'll just stop there, I think, and hand it back to you, Wayne. Yeah, if, um, so I'm, what I wanted to add here is that what's significant is that after September 11th, we changed our approach to terrorism. And that's where I think we, we went wrong. So like Fahad, it's not that I think that there is no such thing as terrorism or a terrorist act. But before September 11th, what we did was we focused on the act. So for example, we defined a bombing of a public building or a railway as a terrorist act. We didn't focus on communities. Mm -hmm. After September 11th, we went from what was called a functional approach to a stipulative approach where we stipulated that certain communities were higher risk. And that's where I think we went wrong. And we went wrong for a number of reasons. Is when we stigmatized those communities, but then once we directed our attention to them, we actually then missed other forms of violence. And we start playing catch up then, like, oh, we better go after this community now. So white supremacists, as Fahad has said, um, didn't receive the attention because they weren't stipulated to be part of the problem, even though in reality, they are part of the problem. So um, I think that would be my answer is that we need to go back to an approach that focuses on the conduct rather than suggests that certain communities are particularly um, at, at risk. And the risk there is that we miss some of the really uh, problematic conduct. Right. You know, what you're what you've been talking about in terms of the stipulative approach, which I that the dis, that distinction in that language really, I think, helps helps clarify something about the difference between those approaches. So I appreciate that history. Um, this makes me think of the, the thing that happened, I believe, in the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago, where a huge long list of groups, including the Proud Boys and I think some others um, were just pronounced to be. I forget if they were designated as hate groups or, or something, something else. Um, and uh, it's interesting to think about that action uh, in light of the possibility that that opens up a whole bunch of other terrain for potential surveillance actions and police and all the, the kinds of things that, that you're talking about here. Um, and that did catch a, a large range of um, white supremacist groups and and uh, far right organizers. Um, do you what what do you make of of that that action by the government? Pat, do you want to go ahead and then I'll jump in again? Sure, thanks, Rim. Uh, so, yeah. So, what happened? Uh, I want to say yes, maybe certainly in January, it was after the January 6th right. uh, sort of storming of the Capitol in the United States, that Proud Boys and three other far-right groups were listed as terrorist groups. So this is on the terrorism watch list. They went on the terrorism okay. watch list. Uh, 
this was an addition to two groups uh, that were put on the watch list in uh, 2019, mid 2019, I want to say. Uh, so now there are six far right groups since mid 2019 on the terrorism watch list, uh, which has a total of 75 or so groups, just so you know, like, I mean, it's the, the terrorism watch list in 2001 had something in the neighborhood of 30 ish groups and today has 75 ish groups. I should also note that in addition to adding the four far right groups, there were uh, like, I don't know, like nine or so Islamist groups that were also added to the terrorism watch list. So the terrorism watch list is predominantly Islamist groups. Now, some of these are, I mean, you know, we don't have to get into sort of the discussion of whether these groups uh, are legitimately placed on that list or not. But the discussion we can get into is how they're placed into that list. Uh, and that is somewhat uh, uh, sort of uh, based on intelligence information that we are not privy to. It's not a democratic process. And once you're on the watch list, it's near impossible to get off that watch list. That watch list has only been growing, which again, the question for us raises these concerns about like, what's the process? What's the democratic process for us to engage in that? Uh, the second thing to say is that with placing Proud Boys on that list, uh, all of the arguments we made about the incel stuff, like using the preemptive techniques, using countering violent extremism programs, all of that would now apply to far right groups as well. And in fact, are being applied to those groups already, uh, albeit, albeit to a much, much smaller extent than they're, they're being applied to uh, people who are suspected of being part of an Islamist group. That's still very much the central focus of uh, RCMP national security investigations. But with all of this, I think it comes back to the last point that we made, which is like, how do we want to address these problems, uh, especially the kind of problems that we think lead people into violence uh, eventually, right? Like, do we want a security, you know, a, 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 a sort of a, a carceral response, or do we want to take a societal uh, response and a long-term view of how to really address these issues within the different systems and within the fabric of our society? Uh, and I think, you know, at least, you know, my view very much aligns with sort of the view of the uh, of the protesters who have been calling to defund the police, which is essentially a an idea that says that hey, we should be investing more in education, uh, in social support and counseling and sort of non-policing, non-security functions of the state rather than policing and security functions of the state. And it's more about kind of how do we think these types of problems, violence, offense will get solved in society, uh, you know, altogether. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add. I think Fahad has covered what I wanted to, uh, or would have um, said. Um, I think it's a it's a this is a really hard one because people that who both Fahad and I, if I can speak for you, Fahad, uh, really admire, um, in particular, celebrated the listing of Proud Boys, and. Um, I struggle, I struggle with it because of course, on the one hand, um, you see the, the, you know, the, the violence and the potential that, for violence that comes out of um, these groups in particular. But as Fahad has pointed out, what I really worry about are the long-term implications of addressing this kind of violence through national security listing without a broader um, societal response that looks at, as people have called it, um, the root causes and looking at why we have these kinds of issues in society and, and addressing that as well. And then as Fahad has pointed out, um, just really worry about how these mechanisms just entrench the very apparatus that, um, if we're just even thinking in terms of resources, suck away resources from the kind of long-term responses that we actually, in broader societal responses that I think we actually need. Fair enough. And I mean, it's 
you know, uh, what Fahad was was just saying about the fact that, you know, there were these three uh, white supremacist far right groups added to the watch list. And that's what we heard a lot about. And also there was seven or eight, did you say, um, Islamist, allegedly as uh, Islamist groups um, added. Uh, it's, it's kind of laughable on its face to me, the idea that the terrorism charge can be like redeemed from an Islamophobic framing. Um, like I, 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 it's very interesting to see um, people try to frame the addition of a very small and narrow slice of other kinds of violent behavior um, as if now this is, you know, sort of this like colorblind approach to, to dealing with ideology and violence, um, which is a little silly on its, on its face, I think. Um, so we, we are at 4.30. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for that excellent discussion. Thank you to those who attended for writing in with your questions. Just before we part, I want to throw to Nat, just because I think he's going to suggest one or two of OGEN's resources that touch on some of these issues that uh, teachers can use to, to bring this conversation into their classrooms. Yeah, no, thanks. I, uh, <laughs> the first thing I want to do is just echo Michelle's thanks for this really, really interesting conversation. I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking about, and particularly for teachers is, you know, you're at this point with your students, you know, particularly if you're, if you're a secondary teacher, where you've got these kids who have this sort of very concrete view of things, but are starting to mature into a, into a more, well, a more mature kind of um, developmental position with respect to complex matters. And it just seems to me like this is such a great way to start to talk about two things that can be bad and true at the same time, or good and true at the same time, and to teach people to sit a little bit with that ambiguity and to, instead of rushing to a judgment, actually to think something through. And I can remember talking about this, you know, when, the, when, this, cha when this charge was initially announced, I had this reaction, which was, you know, um, well, basically, like like Reem, like you had said, oh, good, with respect to the Proud Boys, oh, good, that's, you know, that makes sense to me. And then quickly, I started to remember that actually everything else that I've said about terrorism charges for the last 20 years has been, oh, bad. So, you know, how is it that I'm, that I'm so willing to, to sort of change so quickly without, you know, without that reflection? So it's great. Um, a couple of things just to mention, and we will uh, throw these links up when we post the, this talk as well. But on the well, on the on, on the violence against women side of things, I would strongly encourage people to check out the resources that are available through the Barbara Schleifer Clinic as well as through Metrac. Um, we have a, a great new talk that we put up in the summertime on uh, on a curriculum around the murdered and missing women, uh, murdered and missing uh, Indigenous women and girls. So we can put that up as well. It's very interesting to start to talk about the state and violence towards women as opposed to the state and violence against women. Uh, on, the, on the terrorism end of things, um, I think we have stuff, a number of things on Canada versus Harcat. So I'll say, first of all, uh, anybody who hasn't done this should immediately get a hold of a, of, a, of a good documentary called The Secret Trial Five, which is about uh, five Muslim men who were charged with or held without charge for a total of like 30 years between them. Um, and uh, it's about the use of a, of a really bizarre instrument um, called a security certificate, which was used in order to detain people without a charge. Uh, so I would suggest that you watch that. And then we do have a lot of the stuff on the actual cases. So we've got stuff on Harkat and we've got stuff on Sharkawi. Uh, the Cotter family has been, uh, has been you know, very much involved with the Canadian state, both, uh, both Omar Cotter and his brother. So we have a number of cases in our top fives that have dealt with that. Uh, and then uh, just sort of rounding things out towards uh, sort of protest and state and things, I would also suggest well, we have a, a great resource called Policing in Society, which puts uh, uh, questions in the context of what police forces are supposed to do and what tools and instruments they have for them. Um, and, uh, and I would also have a look, if you feel like it, at our Idle No More resource, which looks at some of the ways in which um, different kinds of oppositional voices with respect to the state have been taken up. Um, so uh, those are all, all, all great things, and I, I know you're going to do well with them, um, and I'll just uh, uh, 
on, I'll, I'll bow out here and say thanks again. I, I really enjoyed listening to that. Yeah, thank you. And I've, I've just uh, advanced the slides to show you some recommended additional reading uh, from our panelists today uh, that, that are up now. Um, We've been actively dropping links into the chat, so hopefully you guys can pull them out of there. And we'll also include them all in the follow-up email that uh, all of our attendees will get. Um, so with that, thank you once more to Fahad Ahmad and Reem Badi for being here, for engaging in this, in this conversation with us. It's been really, really wonderful. Uh, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. I um, wanted to give a shout out to all the teachers today. I come from a family of teachers and uh, just want to say thank you for everything that you do and in particular during these times. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Bye.